Hey, fellow workers, just a heads up before this podcast starts, the guest I was meeting with was in a rural location, and so it had some connection issues. We tried to work with it the best we can, but just wanted to give you a heads up that there'll be a couple of spots in the podcast interview that seems a little bit spotty, but I tried to clean up as best I could in post. Hopefully it's not too bad, and that you'll be able to get a lot out of this interview. Enjoy the show. Hey, fellow workers, this is Kim Siever, and you are tuning in to episode nine of season two for the Alberta Worker Podcast. We are a proud member of the Labor Radio Network and new as of this season, the Harbinger Media Network. We're broadcasting from the territory of the Mitsitsapi, and I'm pleased to announce this week's guest, Samantha Jones, a nurse scientist and writer. Welcome, Samantha. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Great. Yeah. I'm looking forward to um, having this conversation with you. We might as well just get right into it. So we'll just have you share your life story, you know, where you grew up, what your family life was like, where you went to school, that sort of thing. And as well, share your personal labor history with us, what your first job was, subsequent jobs, what you're doing now, the journey that you took to get here, that sort of thing. Floor's all yours. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So I grew up in Nova Scotia, which is actually where I'm calling you from today, but I'm, I'm not in my childhood home. I'm calling in from near the Minas Basin, which is a famous region with high tides, if you've heard of the Fundy region. But I grew up in a city, so I grew up in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. It used to be its own city across the harbor from Halifax, but it's now all sort of the Halifax regional municipality. I was born in Halifax, but spent most of my childhood and then my teenage years in Dartmouth. And that's where I went to elementary school, even lived for the first few years of university, where I was uh, attending back on the Halifax side at Dalhousie. My family is just me, a sibling, and my parents. Both of my parents uh, were working. Um, so when I was had a child care center in our home. And when I was small, I also attended. She also was working outside the home. She was a teacher. She uh, ended up doing um, like early literacy as a specialty. So she worked in all different schools across Nova Scotia, became a vice principal and then a principal. So I got to see her sort of have that career trajectory, but also, you know, it was closely tied with me because in the summer I was often with her. And I was getting to see, you know, inside of the schools where she was setting up and like all these sorts of things. So that was, I think, really informative for me. And my dad is a scientist. Both my parents are retired now. Um, he was a scientist. Um, he worked as a physicist and he was a student when I was born um, doing his grad degree and then worked as a physicist, as a government research scientist for his whole career. So I had sort of the reading specialty in the arts and the sciences at home, which I'm very fortunate to have experienced. And then I went on to go to Dalhousie for university and then eventually University of Calgary. But, you know, in thinking of my labor history, I was thinking back to what my first job was, and it was in the community and mostly child minding. So I started as a, a babysitter, which I think a lot of, of teenagers do or preteens, and then working more as a nanny. So actually spending more dedicated time during the day, like during school breaks for, you know, a child that was in the neighborhood. So I got hired to essentially be childminder, but all day doing meals, entertaining them, all that sort of stuff. And I also worked retail as well, which I think is also fairly common that folks who are students are, are juggling those two things at the same time. And so I worked at a number of stores. I think the first store that I worked at was the Bay. And then I worked at Levi's and Kohl's. And I am a horrible salesperson. Um, <laughs> people are like, you know, when you're working, especially retail, you have, you know, your quotas you're supposed to make and you're trying to sell ads. You're like, oh, do you need this? No. Oh, okay then. <laughs> like maybe you don't <laughs> need that. So yeah, it's that, I think I was too tentative to really convince people, you know, um, but I worked there for a while. And in one of the summers, you know, I was working multiple part-time jobs and sort of cobbling together a more full-time schedule. But then of course, going into university, I sort of had to pick one. And so I stayed at Levi's, I think, because it paid more, um, but they were always, you know, getting across at me for like, sell more stuff. I'm like, I don't know, do you like, do you really need to sell more stuff? <laughs> um, so that was definitely not a, na a natural thing for me, but I, I stuck it out. I also did some more occasional stuff. Growing up, the main sort of sport activity I did was ballet, jazz, modern dance. And I ended up doing some substitute teaching for the younger groups and kids classes on occasion. So that would be 
a more sporadic role, but it was sort of a, a theme where I'd start to see how, you know, participating in different spaces, mentorship spaces, I guess, would continue to be part of other jobs that I did in the future. I started to go to university. At that time, I still lived with my parents on the Dartmouth side and I would commute to the Halifax side. And that's like actually kind of a fun party fact I like to joke about with people in Alberta. I'm like, oh, I used to commute a ferry, but it's like the big, huge ferry and how like it's like the bus basically. So it's not like a special uh, thing. So I'd go like to the sea bus there, in Vancouver. And then I had a number of uh, jobs there. I know. Yeah. So I can like make it sound all like, oh, I was going to, but no, it's just like you get your bus transfer and then just go across. Yeah. <laughs> so it's 15 minutes just back and forth. Um, they don't even have to turn it around because it's, you could drive it both directions. Yeah. Same um, in Vancouver. Yeah. You just go either side. Yeah. I, I went to Dalhousie and I was in the earth sciences department and I did geology. It was sort of planned, but it was also a bit serendipitous. I originally applied to go into an integrated science program that they were starting. And it was essentially a first year where you would get prerequisites to then go into any science major at the university. And so they give you sort of a sampling of everything you were a cohort. And so I applied for that. And then when I got my acceptance letter, it hadn't mentioned that. So I was like, hey, I just wanted to check, like, how do I do this? And they were like, whoops, that was a mistake. You were supposed to hear about that. Do you want us to include it? And a lot of time had passed. And I was like, nah, you know what? I think I'm going to do geology. I was thinking about it and this is what I'm going to do. And that's what I ended up going into. And I feel like that's another uh, tendency of mine, which is to sort of take a leap of faith into certain activities. I'm like, that seems really interesting. I think it's good. I want to try it. And I did that. And then in the summers in between my courses, I worked as sort of an assistant or a student researcher in some labs. This program still exists. Um, I'm not sure all the current details, but you can get an undergrad scholarship from NSERC. Then the students are essentially at least at that time, they were paid by NSER to work in a lab. So a lab could hire a student without actually having to necessarily have, you know, grant money to be able to do that, which opened lots of opportunities because then students can be like, I'm coming with my own little summer salary. I'm really passionate about, you know, this topic or whatever. And so you can market yourself a little bit to labs. And so the first lab I worked in, I worked there for two years with another student. We were sort of partners working on everything together, looking at little micro fossils and then using them to correlate different rock units together. We would look at cuttings, which are little rock chips from drill cores, and then be able to look at some fossils. You ideally identify them, and then it can tell you something about, you know, that rock unit correlating with another one in another well, or something about the environment, what was happening at that time. And so we were really just getting the lab set up. And so our tasks were things like figuring out what kind of camera we needed, testing out the microscope, getting the workflows by getting experts to, to help us. There were two of us. The other student went on to become a paleontologist professor at another institution. And then I stayed in geology, but kind of went a different direction. But that was my first lab job. And so that was really interesting to me because I'd seen lab work in courses, but now I'm getting it as more of an employment experience. And how is that the same or different? And also exposure to these other things that weren't included in labs, like, oh, we need to buy equipment. Now we're starting to price out and budget and figure out you know, that type of thing. And then in between my third and fourth year, I was lucky enough to be able to work on what would become my honors thesis project. You have a very small cohort of students that graduated together. And in the honors project, we almost got like one-on-one -on -one attention with professors to work on the thesis. So, you know, it's a full deal. You defend it. It's a little book and everything, which was another really special experience to get that early on, which I don't think I understood how unique that was at the time. I was there from 2002 to 2006. And that thesis project was about volcanic rocks, which was actually the thing I was really excited about to begin with. Different than the lab I worked in to start, but I was also trying to see like as much as I can and you do courses and everything, right? So, so in that summer in between, I was working on the undergrad thesis project. That topic was more about volcanic rocks and I was really interested in mineralogy. And so, you know, trying to access in both 
the jobs and the courses, I had to do a range of different topics to sort of get a feel for what is out there. But I was always really fascinated with looking at minerals under the microscope, understanding what that um, tells us about, you know, the generation of rock units. And so in that project, I was able to have a supervisor at Dalhousie University, as well as supervisors at the geological survey. And so I ended up having three people help me, uh, Dr. Marco Santilli, who was at the university, and then Dr. Mary Claude Williamson and Dr. Hans Bielens, who were both at the geological survey. And so I got to spend some of my working time at the geological survey, which was located in the Bedford Institute of Oceanography. And so even though I wasn't an employee there, I was able to be in that environment, see what people were working on, work on my university project, but be present and help with some field work and get exposure to, you know, how that works. So at this point, I had now seen what's geology like in the university? What's geology like at the survey in a government institution? How are they similar or different? Um, what topics and what drives sort of the research projects and goals at the different institutions? And continued working on that project through the summer, did my thesis. All the meanwhile, I'm thinking about what do I do after undergrad? And companies come through the universities, as probably most people know it, who work in universities, and they'll often be looking for interns, whether it's co-op or they interview or, you know, all these different processes, you know, Department of Natural Resources, engineering firms, oil and gas companies, mining companies, all kinds of different industry, environmental partners, really depends on the department and the local industries as well. But Dalhousie would get a fair amount of Western companies coming to look for summer interns as well. And so I decided to put my name in for a bunch and I did not expect to get honey was not my specialty in geology but I got a few interviews and then I ended up being offered a couple of internships and I took a summer internship with Shell and that's how I ended up moving to Calgary and so at that time my boyfriend who became my husband <laughs> was working in Newfoundland as a geologist and we were talking on the phone one night and I said oh, I have to go because I have to go prepare for this job interview and he's like you know what interview I'm like oh I'm getting interviewed I can't remember which company it was, but I said, I'm getting interviewed by this company. He said, oh, you're moving to Calgary? And I was like, well, no, they're not going to hire me. I think it's really good to try the interview, see what that process is like, but you know, I have to be prepared. And then I actually ended up getting the offer. And so at that point, you know, it's really challenging to find jobs at that time. I can't speak to now because we've lived in Alberta for uh, since 2006, but at that time, it was very hard to find jobs for new university graduates. And, you know, there are a few positions and they didn't pay particularly well. And it was very hard to get started as a student and even be able to afford like basic, things. you know, what if I get it? And it's like, well, well maybe we should, we could just move to Calgary. <laughs> And so at that time we thought, all right, we're going to move out there for the internship. I, it seemed really far to move out there and then move back after four months. So I'm going to just apply to grad school at West and that will be a um, in, spontaneous impulse that I had was going to apply at West for grad school. I really want to do a master's since we're already moving. Let's just do that. So I applied to U of A and U of C. The two projects are completely different. The U of A project was Kimberlite project. And those are the rocks that host diamonds a lot of times and sometimes other minerals. And then the U of C was a meteorite project, picking lots of different topics. Again, on theme for me is just do something completely not related to everything else. And I ended up choosing the meteorite project. So we moved to Calgary. I worked a summer internship. I did not think I would be offered a full-time job out of the summer internship. So I was all ready to go do this master's. And then I was offered a full-time job out of the internship, but I really wanted to do the master's. So I went and I did this master's in meteorites. And so I was at University of Calgary in at that time, it was called Department of Geology and Geophysics. It's now just geoscience, I believe. And I worked on my master's with um, Dr. Alan Hildebrand, and I was studying meteorites. I did all kinds of interesting things. I was actually measuring the sound waves as they travel through slabs of meteorites because we can learn things about the density and the porosity and sort of the internal structure and the makeup from how fast 
sound travels through the materials. And then if we know something about that, we can start to think about, well, what can we infer about the parent bodies like asteroids, where they came from? And how does that inform us if we're thinking about how things collide in the space or that type of thing. And so it was a very like technical, like space science thing. And so I graduated with the master's in geology with a specialization in planetary science. In the meantime, Shell had held my job and I returned as a geologist. And so then I also had an industry geology perspective. So I see it in university, I see it in uh, government and I see it in industry. And I I feel like that's such a unique perspective. And so I'm really fortunate for that. And so I worked there for a number of years. Um, I had different roles. I was really receiving training on the job because again, my specializations in geology were first of all, like volcanics and stuff as an undergrad and then space science. But of course, all the you know classic geology principles apply to the rocks you see everywhere. A lot of those transferable skills about how to understand data, how to do mapping, how to do all those basic things. And so I did a bunch of different work there. Um, I worked, I started in sort of operations, which is the job where you're up at the crack of dawn, getting the phone calls from the field to see, you know, what progress is made, what do we have to do? How do we, you know, respond to the changes in geology that we're seeing? Do we have to make decisions about changing, you know, drilling a well, for example, because we thought that this particular unit was going to be at this depth, but now we realize it's actually deeper and what's going on. And we need a geologist to sort of relook at this and make a new new trajectory. Um, and so the operations role is really to be at the forefront of that. And then you're communicating with the project team in making some of those changes as well. I ended up specializing in what's called static reservoir modeling. And so this was a really computing heavy job, which I loved it. It was to create a 3D model of what the geology unit would be like using geostatistics. So you look at different data points, which could come from a well or a map or different types of information. And then you are connecting and modeling what that unit looks like under the ground. And you are using your knowledge of geology, how environments are either stacked or adjacent to each other in the rock record. So an example would be if you know you end up with a beach here, and if you go down a slope from that, you go into the deep water sediments. But if you go towards land, you go into a different type of sediment. And then how that shoreline might change over time, you can start to predict like what would stack on top of each other or what would erode into other things and what would be beside. In that case, I was um, really getting to sort of use a creative skill set as well as you know geology knowledge to bring that all together. One of the, the things that I really like that comes up in all my jobs is taking different types of information and then assembling them all to tell a story. And I didn't realize I was doing that at that time, but looking back, that was a skill set I was using. How do I take all these different pieces of information and then create something from them to either answer a question or make a prediction? And then I did a few other jobs there. I worked in gas. I worked in heavy oil. I decided I really wanted to go back to school and do my PhD. And that was like a dream I I had always had. In the meanwhile, I had been tinkering around with the idea of being a writer. In my time outside of work, I had gone through University of Calgary continuing education and I was doing the creative writing certificate. And so I was like, oh, I always want to, you know, I'm going to be a writer one day. Like I really, I've always loved being in books, being in bookstores, libraries, like knowledge, just all of it. You know, I was holding on to this dream, any uh, resource industry, but especially like Albertans <laughs> know how much things go up and down with, you know, lots of people being employed and lots of people not being employed. There were a lot of times I didn't know, you know, was I going to have a job or not like soon. So I always had in my mind, well, if I find myself unemployed, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to school because I always wanted to do this. I think I made my contingency plan with so much detail that I became very attached to it. And it was like, well, I'm going to go back to school no matter what, because I, I really <laughs> do. This is where I need to be. It's calling me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I had also worked towards, you know, getting my professional designation as a geoscientist with the PEGA, which I was very proud of, but I, I found it stressful, like just knowing like I, I'm an individual person using my knowledge to do my best, but I am accountable for safety and I'm signing off on this thing and I need to be sure, you know, I probably take those things a lot more to heart 
have been the average person. I have OCD. You know, I really worry about doing something wrong that impacts someone else. And that's one of my sort of OCD cycles that I get into. And it just was really hard for me. And I found it very just uncomfortable all the time to have that on my mind. And I know that's probably a me problem because I'm thinking about it likely a lot more than average. But I also found like, I think that's a strength because I'm very careful and I'm very thoughtful in how I make sure, you know, when I'm handing something off to someone else, I've explained it or that I've really thought about like what the impacts of a certain piece of work or decision are going to be on the next person or the bigger picture. And so I thought I really just would like a transition into doing some studies, I have a few other like life goals. I want to work on also decided to have a family. So I decided I was going to go back to school. And when I was in the process of writing my PhD application, I found out I was pregnant. And so that was exciting because I had to be like, oh no, <laughs> but what do I do now? My application until the next cycle. So I feel like I need to make sure I'm okay, make sure everything's okay before I, you know, turn my life inside out here. What's going to happen? And the reception was totally great. At that point, I was like, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to go back to school no matter what. But also in the meantime, I am having a little one on the way. So that's going to certainly be a change to personal life and work life, right? When was this? This was 2015 when I was applying. So my son was born in 2016. When my son was born, I stayed home with him for almost a year. So that's a, a different type of labor. <laughs> um, doing that sort of work of being there with him. And to be honest, I didn't know what I would feel. I wondered, would I be bored? Would I be really missing being in a workplace? Would I feel frustrated? But I loved it. I loved being home. I read books from the library. I cuddled with him all day and it was lovely. And I still you know, did a lot of things. And one of the little goals I had for myself, which we didn't do at all, but I thought, during this time, I just remember this as I'm like telling you the story, but I had this big map of Calgary with all the city parks on it. Uh -huh. And I wanted to take him to as many city parks as possible for a walk. Right. And so we would go all over and I had never been to half these places. So yeah, it was really fun. And I felt like I got to know my city. I spent a lot of time in the library. So just being with people and seeing what other people were doing and just kind of calmly moving through time was very nice. And then I returned to school with a January start. So I sort of did things a little weird, but at that time, everything's changing, you know, in, in employment, lots of layoffs and different things happening. And I thought this is a very good time to transition into this new thing that I'm doing. My PG, I'm in the department of geography now at the university of Calgary. Um, so back in the same building, but different department. That is because I really wanted to do something related to the Arctic and related to the cryosphere, which is essentially like frozen water on the earth. And so I am working on a carbon cycling project, but from a sort of inorganic and hydrology perspective. So my current project is, and I promise I won't get too, too jargony. I look at greenhouse gases, specifically carbon dioxide and methane, and the they're naturally occurring in the environment there. And they exist naturally in all waters to some degree. Right. And so what I'm looking at is how carbon is moving from the land to the ocean, to the coastal ocean in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut, and how that changes seasonally with the river there, with the rivers frozen for most of the year from about end of October, like it stops flowing because it's completely frozen and it doesn't start again until June. So you have this whole period where there's no river flowing. And then you have sort of a lot of action where things thaw and you get a big pulse of these gases coming under the landscape and going to the ocean. And so I'm looking at sort of this, uh, what exists there naturally in the environment? What is the baseline? How might this change with climate change? What are the risks to the natural environment, depending on different scenarios? I really love it. I've got to go up to the field three different summers, 2017, 18, 19. Uh, one of those summers I went twice. And so I guess I usually go in the spring. I would go in May when everything's still frozen. I'm sort of waiting for the spring melt to happen. And then 
right. you know, measuring uh, different parameters in the water, collecting water samples, and then bringing that all back to Calgary. And so then I work in the lab as well, analyzing all these samples. So I've got sort of this field component of the work, working in a lab setting. And then after you're done with all of that, you have sort of the computing part. Sort of the other work that comes along with that is a lot of teaching responsibilities as a grad student. So people take on teaching assistantships a lot of the time. Sometimes it's part of your funding like package that you get. Sometimes you can opt into extra positions depending on like what's available in the department. And just for folks that are outside of academia that might not know what a teaching assistantship is, in the sciences, usually what will happen is you will end up running, let's say, the lab portion of the class. So the professor is doing the lectures, doing the exams, that kind of thing. And the TA, the teaching assistant, is usually running the labs, doing a lot of the grading, and also sort of that first interface for the students for support. And my and spouse so has been a teaching I've assistant done. a few times as well, like when she was working on her master's and she's just starting a PhD. So she's about to be a teaching assistant, but she's in humanities and social sciences. So they don't have labs per okay. se, but it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, but they probably have things like tutorials and different activities or exercises, essays, that's sometimes group projects as well. Yeah, um, she's having to do all the marketing that, and, yeah. and yeah, first point of contact when they're having issues with the assignments and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and that was one of the things I was sort of brainstorming like, oh, what kind of things? I had a few. I was like reflecting on, first of all, like, am I a worker? Because I'm a student right now. And I was like, what do I do? I go on the work of podcast. Do I work? I'm like, of course I work. I'm doing my thesis, which is a full-time research role. I'm doing these teaching assistantships, which yes, they're called assistantship, but it's a little bit mis misleading because you are teaching things. And also I'm a, a freelance worker as well. So it was strange for me to reflect on what do I think of when I think of work? And what, what is being sort of excluded and why, and not necessarily excluded by me, but like in general. And I think that happens with students quite a lot where it's like, oh, you're a student or, oh, you're this. And then, but those people are really doing a lot of labor and it's sort of categorized as this gray area, which is interesting. And also I think can be quite frustrating. So I'm always here to be like, grad students, like, a lot of them are actually super specialized, like experts in things. And like they are doing a lot of important stuff. So yeah, absolutely. And the yeah, universities are benefiting from that labor <laughs> you as well. Know. Yeah. And it's, I think, I think the students, like uh, the undergrad students really appreciate that bridge as well. Having that extra person. I know like I've only had very good experiences with all the different types of classes I've done. And I've done them from, I don't even know how many I've done them, probably like nine or 10 or something like that. But everything from like a little field course to like a big, huge class where there's hundreds of people and I'm just sort of grading their stuff and then helping them when they have emailing me with challenges that they're having. So, you know, there's all sorts of different kind of tasks that get encompassed in that work. And then all the while, <laughs> still trying to be a writer. I keep saying that, but I do find Probably, I don't know what year it was, a couple of years ago, I was like, you know what? I am a writer. It's happening. It's now. And I started getting serious about not just working on things, but sending it out, being present in places like Twitter, where I'm not just saying, hey, hire me or like, look at the thing I made, but talking to people like authentically, I'm interested um, in, in being there and talking to people. And I think when that happens and there's just sort of an ease about it, then other people get attracted to it. And so you end up, you know, later on getting a cold call with, hey, you know, I thought of you when I saw this, you want to help with whatever. And so types of engagements as well, particularly for freelancing. At first was sort of on the side, publishing a poem here and there or doing a little bit of writing. And if you can sell it to a magazine, like with literary writing, usually you do it first and then you send it and you hope someone accepts it it and then they pay you which is a little bit different than journalism when you're pitching something and hoping someone will then hire you you have a finished piece you send it out and if a magazine decides to to run it they're you know buying it from you for that first publishing rights in the magazine so you can get a little check for that sometimes and so I would just do that on occasion and I love to like when I get like a little check like that I'm like oh I'm gonna buy groceries with this or I'm gonna pay you know half my power bill with this and it just feels it does even though those little bits are small they can add up it's a lot of work but you can build you know a decent side gig at least in my case doing that and then I was also doing some teaching so 
when I got enough credits, I started running a few little workshops that I designed through the Alexandra Writer Center Society. I pitched them to them and they said, yeah, you know, teach under our umbrella. And nice. I would teach people like how to submit your poetry to magazines, how to do these kind of things and just like a little mini two hour workshop. And so I got like a bit entrepreneurial with how do I make these opportunities for myself? And then I just kept going with that. And, and the more that I built, then people would start requesting things. And so now I'm, I'm very fortunate that I'm at the point where I don't send out a huge amount because I'm finding I'm so busy trying to keep up with things people are asking from me. So typically with poetry, you know, I'd be sending them out, get a spell check, teaching other people in these sort of workshops how to do similar things. And then I would do word of mouth or through social media asking me to do different things. Could I read somewhere and you might get a small honorarium? Could I write a book review? And so these smaller requests would come in and a lot of them are like very, very interesting. And so I got to try a lot of different things that I don't know if I would have tried without someone prompting me, to be honest. And so that was really nice. And I think it was a way to broaden both my portfolio, but also just learn. And I also ended up getting work as a copy editor, which I still do. And it's like a contract base. So each issue of this academic journal, I get a load of work and then I do it. And then I'm sort of invoicing as a freelancer and then it happens again. And so it's for Arctic, which is a, an academic journal published by the, the Arctic Institute of North America. I prepare those articles checking for internal consistency. So if you're telling me figure number one is a map of Alberta and I look and it's Newfoundland, I'll be like, oh, um, did you mean to have a different map or should I change the mention in the text? And so I'll prepare a query sheet for the author so that anything like that can get fixed. And then when it goes out, you know, it's polished in the best it can be. And any little things that, because the author's seen it so many times, you just miss stuff, right? Can all be polished. So I really like it because it's a cool job to do, but I also get to read all these articles about the Arctic and they're all different topics. So I work in the Arctic, but you know, I'm reading about all these sorts of things that people are studying and I'm learning a ton from just being exposed to you know, everything from stellar wayfinding in Indigenous communities to different bears, grizzly, polar bear hybrids, and all sorts of things that are completely outside of my uh, my knowledge, but wonderful to know. Before and I was so doing the Alberta Worker, I was a freelance copy editor. Probably the bulk of the copy editing I did was master's theses. Uh, oh, it was, yeah. yeah, it was a wide range of topics because it wasn't just from one discipline. And it was fascinating because, I mean, I had to read through the entire thing in order to be able to edit it and get a sense of style and stuff. And yeah, I learned so much by doing that over a period of, um, I don't know, like, eight or nine years and yeah it was pretty cool yeah it's amazing like the range of things that I get to see you know right now working on that still occasionally doing teaching working on my PhD um, my supervisor is Dr. Brent Els he's kind of oceanography type guy so when I started my project it was coastal ocean but I'm doing a little bit inland for a group to sort of see how the river system is impacting the ocean there and then of course still having a young guy at home and my husband and I just looking after him. COVID, I guess that did change for a while because I very quickly became a stay-at-home parent. <laughs> my son was in preschool and everything shut. Yeah, I, I was like, all right, I'm. this is what I'm doing. At first, my husband and I were like, all right, we're going to split the work from home, you know, 50-50. Like you go to the office and work one half a day and the other person can sort of work out here, but also entertain him. And then we trade. But very quickly, like I ended up having, just because of the nature of the flexibility of our jobs, I ended up having to do most of it. Um, and so it made sense for a lot of different reasons, but I had to really have this mindset shift to be like, this is what I'm doing now. And I need to stop trying to work on the other thing because this time with my son, instead of you know, feel any resentment to the fact that I'm getting behind and something else or because what, right. you know, realistically, what does that matter in the big picture, right? For me at that time, this is what I'm doing. So I yeah. still work when I could, weird hours, answering emails, doing stuff. Um, but I also, you know, spent that time with him. And so that's kind of where I'm at now and sort of, I probably forgot some stuff. Yeah, actually, I just have one question. It was fascinating. That's a really cool story. But you mentioned that your husband's a geologist as well. And I was just wondering if you met in school. 
since you both have a background in geology. We met in our undergrad at Dalhousie. He was one year ahead of me. And so he graduated. I still have my last year to do. Uh, and then he started working right away in environmental fields. He's done water stuff since the very beginning. So the two of us coming out to Alberta was good. And also being able to have these sort of shared interests has been a thing as well. Cause I mean, our interest for geology and love of, you know, the natural world and seeing things that's a lot of our rocks, like stuff people do like, you don't want to go on a family vacation, <laughs> like, but it was fun for us. So, yeah. Sure. That's cool. All right. So then uh, at this point, I usually ask my guest the same question. How has your intersections of marginalization influenced your experiences as a worker? And what I mean by this is, you know, how has your identities regarding gender, um, sexual orientation, religion, ethnicity, age, disability, whatever, how have those identities come together in how others have treated you during your experiences as a worker? Yeah, thank you for that question. And, you know, I was listening to other episodes and I found this very enlightening to hear people talk about it. And so some of the themes will probably sound familiar. I mean, obviously one that I brought up was being a mom, being a woman has a few different elements. Like first of all, being a woman in a male dominated field is definitely a noticeable thing in geology and seeing, you know, on starting out levels, you might have equal in what you're seeing around you and think, okay, it's just sort of everyone's represented here. There's, you know, people of all genders, but then as you move up the management chain or the levels, you will see that tends to be especially male dominated. But then of course, I, I also have my son. And so I ended up staying, staying at home. Um, for benching assistantship because some of the classes start at 8 a.m. lab or something like that. And so that was really hard for me to get to because I have to get my son to childcare. And then if it's a snowstorm, how do I make it in time? And sometimes the childcare might not even open in time. So um, right. I had to request stuff, right? And be really uncomfortable doing that. But I'm always mindful that like not everyone is and saying like, I can't do this time slot because and not fear, you know, that, that there's going to be any sort of issue for me after that. So that would be one. I think the other one that's especially um, top of mind is ability. You know, I've done a lot of field work. I've done a lot of geology stuff, which I talked about, you know, climbing all over things. But in the last couple of years, I live with chronic pain, um, back pain, and I have for quite some time, but I've had a really severe pain for the last few years to the point where sometimes I couldn't leave my home. And so that made a lot of tasks really challenging for me, even uh, being at a computer. And so that made me rethink, you know, if I can't stand, I can't do lab work. If I can't sit at the computer, I can't even be working on this other thing. And so how do I change my workstation? What do I even need? What's available to me? And I'm still trying to figure that out while also sort of processing the emotions around how am I feeling about what's happening and what am I letting go of? And and where do I have choice and where do I not? And so thinking about, you know, how our earth science is accessible or not accessible, which a lot of, a lot of it is not, if it requires certain field tasks, for example, and how do we work towards making sure, you know, we're not just saying, well, you can have an exemption from this task and do this instead, but truly making like an equivalent that is engaging and interesting and, and ideally everyone should be able to participate in everything together. And so this is something that I'm probably coming to this too late compared to other people who are experts in accessibility, but I'm glad I'm here and I hope <laughs> that I can help improve things for everybody. So that's certainly something that is impacting me, but I also hope to be able to, you know, be an advocate for other people. Yeah. And I totally understand that. I have arthritis. I've had arthritis since I was probably 20 years old so, and I'm 50 now. And so mm -hmm. in the last 30 years and the last uh, year or so, it's really intensified. I had a couple of injuries last year that basically destroyed whatever remaining cartilage was in my knees. And so it's difficult for me to be able to walk long distances or be on my feet a lot during the day. And so I've been working from home for the last 10 and a half years. And so it's, I haven't noticed it as much, but I tried to go back into the workforce earlier this year. I had a 
job where I was stacking products in a, in a grocery store. And mm -hmm. um, I found that it was too difficult. Physical labor is really difficult for me to do now. I, I too can't stand for long periods. I too can't sit at the computer for long periods. And I, the nice thing about working from home is I have some flexibility. Not only that, but then I'm also 50 years old and no one's going to hire someone who has only 10 or 15 years left in the workforce. They want young people who are going to be there for a long time. Yeah. So I totally understand mm -hmm. what accessibility looks like. And uh, there's a lot of jobs out there who don't put that priority on accessibility. They often, I think, have just one idea in mind when they're thinking about accessibility. Oh, mm -hmm. well, you need a comfortable seat. Okay, well, then we'll just provide you a comfortable seat, not realizing, well, I can't sit for long periods. Uh, I can't stand for long periods. Yeah. I can't sit for long periods. And so it's difficult in that way. So yeah, I totally get it. Yeah, and it, it was interesting too, because I think one of the things, and I knew this was going to happen, but I still was like, you know how you know something's going to be and then you're still like wow why is it like this once you need accommodations for example then you have to go fill all the forms and do all the things and I was like I don't want to fill this in I'm tired like can't I just have the thing that I need right and so I was really like why are there so many forms like it's just exhausting for the little bit of energy that you had to work you then wasted on stuff but once I figured out things it was okay but yeah even just the thought of like I have to figure out how to do this seemed like too much for me when I was in the middle of like the pain flare and so for me like I have very comfortable ergonomic new furniture on campus but my issue was like I could not walk from my vehicle to my building because it was too far away it turned out to not be hard to get the parking that I needed but I did need to go to several appointments so there was like work there um, and things that needed to be done. At first, I was like, I just can't even think about this because I don't have capacity. And so I mostly just worked from home until I was like, all right, I'm feeling well enough that I'm going to send these emails and see what I need to do, right? That helped a lot. But then I was always, you know, thinking, should I ask for this? Should I not? And I was like, well, of course I should ask for it because if I can do my job because I haven't wasted all my energy just arriving at my job, like, <laughs> you know, then that is helpful for everybody, including me. And it relieves so much stress. I think the other main thing in terms of intersectionality for me is like, I come from mixed heritage. My mom's family is white European descendant. My dad's family is both French Canadian and black Canadian, but I'm like a light skinned person. And oftentimes people don't know what my ethnicity is, or they assume that I'm white, uh, just European settler. And so sometimes I'll be in situations where it's very uncomfortable for me because it's almost like people think no one's listening. And so stuff gets said. And then I'm like, okay, here we go. I want to intervene all the time because I feel like ethically I have a duty to like use my privilege to speak up in those situations. It can also be super exhausting if I'm always the person who says something. And so I have to figure out like, when do I do this to like both make it fix something or if it can't fix something, make a point that's impactful, <laughs> but also how do I help myself not get just completely worn down from this and feel proud of the way that I chose to handle it. Right. So I won't go on about that one because I, I think somebody else talked about it in one of your episodes as well. That does come up and I'll often leave being like, oh, it's a frustrating day because, you know, this happened and it wasn't. I didn't face uh, discrimination against me. It's more, I want to use my privilege to make a difference. It means there's head butting and that can be hard when you feel like you have to do it often. And, and sometimes right. can make people feel like, oh, this per person's a pain, right? <laughs> but we've got to be there. We've got to be pain. Sometimes. That's true. Yeah. And I, I kind of get that. Like, so I'm queer and mm -hmm. oftentimes I'll find myself as the only uh, openly queer person in a situation. As a result, like if something comes up and said in that situation, then I feel like an obligation or I have to say something. But like you said, sometimes it could be exhausting because you're the only one that always having to say something. Yeah, I, I kind of get that. But at the same time, like it's different, different from uh, an ethnic minority background because I mean it's, it's a little bit different from you because like you said you you're white passing but people of color who you know are obviously people of color that's not something they can hide right but for me it's my queerness is something I can hide because I don't 
you know, usually present in any stereotypical way or anything mm-hmm. like that. Um, so it's a little bit different, but there's still some similarities there. Yeah. It's, and it's, it can be really challenging because you want to make those improvements, but yeah, it's like, how do you the best use that energy to be like, all right, this is the impact I know I can have and I'm, I'm going for it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Any final thoughts for our listeners? No, I think I just like, I guess, you know, in reflecting to, to come here, I really thought about instead of what work have I done? I reframed it to myself as like, what are all of the labors that I do? And I was surprised how different of an answer I came up with. Maybe that's obvious for folks who think about work and workers and what that means. But if folks haven't had a chance to think about, you know, in general, like all of the labors that they do, I think it's a very worthwhile exercise to try. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. And I've had a couple other stay-at-home moms on the show in the past. And I I always appreciate that because as someone who has been a stay-at-home parent myself, it is actual labor. And it's funny because a lot of the jobs that are looked down upon in society often are descended by work that stay-at-home parents do, you know, cooking, cleaning, childcare, teaching. So I think there's something to that, right? It's people don't value stay-at-home parents and the labor they perform as much as paid labor in the workplace. So when I have stay-at-home parents on the show, I think it just provides a different perspective that I think people can benefit from hearing. Yeah. And I really appreciated hearing that because even though I was only home temporarily, you know, while trying to be a student at the same time, you know, being a caregiver is a real challenge. And for me, it was so rewarding. And yeah, I like really want to elevate those type of work that folks do because, and it's often, you know, marginalized people who are doing those labors as well. So, yeah, absolutely. And that's a whole other layer to it. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So if people are interested in following you and the work that you're doing, is there, are there places pe- they could visit you like public social media accounts or give a blog or a website or anything like that? Yeah, probably the easiest way to find me is on Twitter and I'm just at Jones underscore why once that's a later and and the reason for the the website makeover is because I'm going to have a book in the future so I want to have a space to be able to talk about that yeah that's awesome congratulations yeah thank you yeah it's a it's a poetry book and it will be published by New West which is an indie independent press out of Edmonton so excited to be working with an Alberta press and yeah, more will come on that. So yeah. Awesome. And yeah, I'll be sure to put that information in the, uh, in the show notes for people who are following on their podcast or um, on YouTube as well. Great. And if people are interested in following the Alberta worker, you can find us on social media. We are on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can also visit our website at albertaworker.ca. And when you're there, why not sign up for our, our newsletter? We have daily, weekly, and monthly subscriptions. If you like this podcast, please rate and review it and share it with your friends. If you want to support the Alberta Worker, go to our website at albertaworker.ca slash support, where you can become a monthly subscriber or buy one of these cool t-shirts. Alberta Worker, as well as this podcast, depends on the generous support of listeners like you. If you're interested in being a guest on the Alberta Worker, just email us at podcast at albertaworker.ca or send us a DM on our social media accounts. Thank you very much, Sam, for visiting us today. Thank you also to all of our listeners. And as always, solidarity. Solidarity. Thank you.